being homeless you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next and sometimes you don't know where you're going to lay your head um, but normally I'd wake up um, withdrawing straight away from uh, the substances I was using um, so I'm having to beg on the streets or play my guitar and busk and earn some money so I could get some drugs um, as soon as I'd done that and I was feeling okay I'd have something to eat um, and then I'd go back out onto the streets and I'd start to try and raise more money and then obviously it weren't for the fact that I was needing it it's the fact that I wanted to be off my face so I didn't have to live this uh, tortured life of being on the streets where actually you have so many people that walk past and they just don't care or I wouldn't say they don't care they just don't understand you know and for those that actually did stop and talk it was actually like a, a lifeline for me you know it showed that people out there genuinely still cared and they still wanted to help you know and that's to me was what fundamentally probably half the reason why I had the strength to go to a rehab and get myself sorted was because of the, the generosity and kind words of some of the public. Well, I'm uh, Christopher Galvin, I'm 32 and I'm from here in Leamington Spa. Well, I've been homeless several times, so three times in my life I've been homeless. Um, the last time was the longest time I spent on the streets, which was uh, three and a half years. Um, it was a big problem, it wasn't nice. Um, it's not something I intended to be doing was like living on the streets, but like anybody nowadays, you're just one paycheck away from being on the streets. So when I ended up on the streets from a nervous breakdown, I ended up using drugs in a way of coping with my situation, as it were. Um, yeah, so I just carried on using drugs and it was just a way of life to me, it was just, it wasn't even living to be fair, it was just existing, it wasn't even existing, it was just slowly dying. I had no awareness of time when I was on drugs, so like sometimes I was that intoxicated on, on numerous of drugs that I wouldn't even know the time and I wouldn't know what day it was, you know, they all sort of merged into one. When I was using heroin and crack, I'd put them both together and call uh, it's called a snowball and then I'd inject it into my um, into my body. Um, it just it just numbed you to the uh, the effects of the world. It just gave you that. Give, if anything, I think it did keep me alive for a while while I was on the streets. You know, because if it weren't for being in such a state, I probably would have tried taking my life. You know, but to be fair, I did try before, and I've I've just I never had the guts to really do it so in a way I think the more I was using was trying to slowly like go away peacefully you know yeah. hopefully I would have had an overdose and I would have gone away quietly and that's the real state of my mind up coming towards the end of being homeless before going to rehab was I'm pretty much done now I don't want to be here I don't want to be alive you know and there was one guy who actually stopped me from actually um, killing myself um, I'd had enough and I'd, I was just on methadone at the time because I was trying to stay off stuff and I just couldn't cope so I just got uh, five bags of heroin and put them all in one pin which um, was intended to try and kill myself there and then um, but as I had the uh, needle in my veins some bloke in the pub come, who know, knew me saw me round the corner and the car park where I was doing it ran round and kicked the pin out of my hand you know yeah so it kept kept me alive uh, I've seen him since uh, since being like clean and sober and I've actually thanked him because if he hadn't have done that I wouldn't be here now doing the work that I do which is helping so many other people you know and it's people like him that should really get all the glory you know people that actually do things without actually thinking just doing it because it's a human being that they're seeing there you know all credit has to go out to them as well so this is uh, where I was uh, found by uh, a gentleman and told me about a rehab in Wales so I was sat on this floor uh, just over two years ago where he first come to me and told me about rehab um, unfortunately I was uh, kind of high on drugs at the time and so I was a bit scared to go to rehab um, but yeah this was where 
a, a fundamental place for me because it was the start of my journey. At the time I was kind of scared so I was like no I'm okay I don't need rehab I'm okay you know and then um, a few weeks later I phoned the gentleman back up and I was like I need this rehab and he was like I can't pick you up for a few weeks I was like I ain't gonna last that long I says how about if I could make my own way there could I have a spot or a placement he's like yeah he goes if you can get there yourself we'll get you a place so the next day I sold my two guitars and my two phones that I had and I got a train ticket to Wales and I haven't looked back there's three stages to the rehab it kind of like wraps you in a bubble while you're there so you're focusing on yourself you know you're not allowed a mobile phone but you're allowed phone calls but limited amount every week so you can actually focus on yourself and focus on the problems that you've had you know and prepare you for when you re leave the rehab I then ended up coming back here because I felt like a calling was was here for me like um, massively so many doors opened up for me to be able to come back like, obviously a job at Helping Hands um, and my mum wanted me back at home because she's not very well um, so yeah um, this was a, a, a good street that I was always on mm -hmm. I remember one time when um, my trainers had fallen apart and I had no socks and my feet were blistered and bleeding and I broke down in tears just outside just outside there and mm -hmm. so many people come running over and they're like here we go we've just got you some trainers we've got you some shoes but it got to the point <laughs> where I had to break down and, yeah. and actually the stress of it all and the, the hurt and the pain that I was feeling just come all out at once and I just broke down yeah. you know when I was sat on the corner there at one winter and I was in such a, a bad way my cousin walked up and he was like, here, here's some money, get a hotel room. And then some woman that works on a business over the road, she ran over and she was like, here you go, a nice cup of tea. So she bought me a cup of tea, like, you know, and a nice mug, and the heat was nice and warm, mm -hmm. and I could just wrap my hands around it. Nice. It was amazing. Well, church has made, has been a big part of my recovery, you know because the people at church have been nothing but understanding about my past, you know, and they don't hold that against me and they don't judge me, you know. They look at me as if I am a person who's lived this life all my life, you know, and that's really, really something that's massive because without that, without people actually behind you believing in you, you could find yourself actually turning back and slipping and, and going back to addiction. My addiction was probably one of the worst you would see. That my health, my uh, appearance was so bad. It was just to look back. It's like I can't believe I was in that state, you know. And if you see pictures of who I was in addiction and who I am today, you can see it's two different people. Like just. The look of me is completely different, not just my personality. So I've always been a polite person to everybody on the, in the public, but um, I would have done certain things that I would never have done while I was on drugs, you know. So like, there's times where I have, I've lied, you know, I've robbed, I've, I've stole, and I've, I've been violent towards others, you know. But today, I'm completely different lot. Like, I don't swear hardly at all. Like before it used to be every other word or in every sentence I'd throw in an F bomb or something like that. Um and now I've just got more grace upon me. Like I have patience and peace, joy and happiness. I have it all. Um now I work alongside with Happy Hands I do eight hours of paid work and the rest voluntary. So I will volunteer in the shop on a Monday and a Tuesday and do soup kitchens once or twice a week and drop in every Tuesday morning. Um, so fundamentally I'm just still there showing people that I'm still clean, I'm still doing what I need to be doing and, I, and it still can happen for them, you know. And they all say it when they come in, they're like, we're so amazed by how much you've changed, Chris. You know, and some of them do come with by my old street name, which was Galvin. And like, I'm like, no, I killed him with a Bible, you know. You know, the old man is dead, as it were. And they're like, 
wow it's just encouraging to hear people coming up to me saying look please keep up doing what you're doing and these people were in addiction as well and still are and they're there like ah, please don't go back to it please don't go back to it which is kind of really encouraging in a way because most people on drugs they can't wait to see people fall sometimes you know and with me it's like they just want to see me succeed My future goal is to um, open up a rehab and help uh, other people in, in the situation I was in. Um, I'm also um, just about to start um, a counselling course in addiction and then hopefully in September start a level 3 counselling course to be able to uh, give more help to those in need. You know, because sometimes it's not um, good enough of just doing it from a textbook sometimes people need to engage with somebody that's been there and been through it you know so they can see the realism of it and see that actually do you know what there's light at the end of the tunnel you know so it's just about giving people a glimmer of hope mm -hmm.